This is my cell phone, and my cell phone is very important to me. I read my emails on it. I talk to my friends on Facebook on it. I check the weather before I go outside, and I look at funny cat pictures. <laughs> my phone is very important to me because it touches so many different aspects of my life. My phone is also very important to a lot of companies because by looking at my internet browser history, they can learn about who I am. And it's not just my phone, it's my laptop, it's my iPad, it's anything I use to connect to the internet. Companies are interested in what I'm doing. And it's not just me, it's every single one of you. Every time you connect to the internet, companies want to know, who are you? What are you interested in? Welcome to the world of big data. The world is changing, and you need to understand how and why, because you're part of it. We currently live in the information age, and there is one rule here. Knowledge is power. This is a common saying. You've probably heard it before, but I need you to be convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is truth. So I'm going to convince you. Entire books have been written about this idea. One of the most common, one of the most popular, is the art of war. It's this fundamental concept that you can overcome a difference in power by leveraging a difference in knowledge. So OK, it's popular. That doesn't mean it's right. So let's look at a case study. You've probably heard of America. Let's go back to the Revolutionary War. You have a brand new militia, these scarcely trained people, and they are going to fight the British Empire and their highly trained veteran redcoats. How can you possibly win? You start using guerrilla tactics. You start outmaneuvering them, outsmarting them, and suddenly you have a new nation on your hands. Here's a new example. This one's my favorite. Batman. This is a superhero with no superpowers. How does that work? He's just a regular guy. But by leveraging knowledge, by using technology, he can accomplish superhuman feats. Knowledge is power. And the reason that I'm making this point, the reason I'm trying to drive this home over and over is because we live in a time when there is more information than ever before. Never has knowledge been so readily available. In 2010, there were over 50 billion photographs on Facebook. That number has skyrocketed. Three years later, in 2013, there were over 350 billion. That's huge. Uh, that is mind-bogglingly large. In fact, there is no other word I can use to describe it other than big. <laughs> big is, in fact, the perfect word. This is not a coincidence. How many people have heard the term big data before? It is a popular term, and it is going to become more popular in the very near future. What is big data? Well, some of the problems that we are facing today are so large that they cannot be solved using traditional analysis techniques. Uh, why? Why not? They've worked before. What's different? There are two big differences that define a big data problem from a regular problem. The first is volume. How much data is there? This is Google, and last year, they processed over one trillion searches. One trillion? That's a lot of information. You can clearly learn something from that. But if you're going to do that, you need to be able to look at all of that information. You need to store it somewhere. Computers have gotten better. The first computer had so little memory that if you took a photograph with your cell phone today, it would be too large. There's too much data there to be stored in the first computer. So we've clearly made some progress. But that's a trillion searches up there. You can't store that in a laptop. 
or in 10 laptops, you need to change how you organize your data. What's more, traditional algorithms don't work anymore. They'll work in the sense that they'll get you an answer, but it's going to take you 200 years. So we need not just new hardware, we need new ways to store data. We need new algorithms to process it faster. That is a volume big data problem. There's another kind of big data problem. That's velocity. This is a picture of the Large Hadron Collider. It is a 17-mile-long track that straddles the border between France and Switzerland, and it accelerates subatomic particles to near the speed of light and then smashes them together. That's really cool. However, when you do that, you produce a lot of information really, really quickly. It is very much like if you are a student in class, you're trying to take notes on what the teacher is saying, but the teacher has a lot of really good information and they seem to talk really, really fast and they don't even need to breathe and they just keep going and going and going and going and you can't get all of it. So what do you do? You filter out the most important stuff. You listen. And this is exactly what they do at CERN, the uh, organization that runs the Large Hadron Collider. In real time, they filter out what's most important and what's least important because they can't capture everything. And so they need to decide what to do with it all. That's a velocity big data problem. So, OK, big data, it's kind of a big deal. Why is it happening? Why now, for one? We have made some advances in the ability to store information and the algorithms we use, but we also have the internet. That whole part where there's more information than ever before, that Facebook, that Google, we are creating information. Now the Large Hadron Collider probably does not impact you every day. So let's pick an example of something that might pop up more in your daily life, like advertisements. That was a uh, pop-up ads, by the way. Thank you, thank you. So why advertising? For one thing, it's something we've all encountered. Advertising is pervasive. For another thing, it's something that companies are very, very interested in. It's very easy for them to see the value here. If you have better ads, more people buy your stuff, you make more money. Boom, 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 we like it. So. How is, how is all of this new information, how is big data impacting advertising, and how does it pertain to you? The first kind of advertisements were completely untargeted. Let's say you put an advertisement on a billboard. You don't know anything about who is driving by. You can't say anything to reach out to someone driving by, and so you just have to appeal to as many people as possible. It's untargeted. But let's say that you're buying advertising space on TV. Suddenly, you know a little something about your audience. Gillette should not be advertising shaving cream on Cartoon Network. And Hasbro should not be trying to sell Play-Doh during the Super Bowl. The people, the audience just isn't interested. You know something about them, and so you control your advertisements. So we went from untargeted to targeting a general demographic. The next logical step is targeting individual people. This is big data. This is the future. It's actually the present, but it's going to become more and more important. So what is an advertisement that targets you on the internet? It's called a banner ad. And even if you haven't heard the term before, I bet you're going to recognize it. This is a weather website. You can see today's forecast. You can see some news articles and that red box is an advertisement. That's State Farm Auto Insurance. How did that get there? This is another weather website. And we've got the weekly forecast and sunglasses. Why are those there? How did they get there? This is a process known as real-time bidding. And there are billions of these transactions every day. And every single one of them takes milliseconds. Let's walk through the process, because this happens every time you visit a web page with an advertisement. This is happening to you. This is 
someone using the internet, let's call them Bob. Bob has just bought a convertible, and he wants to know what today's weather forecast is so that he knows whether he can ride with the top down or not. So Bob goes onto the internet, and he visits weather.com, which has room for an advertisement on it. In the milliseconds before the page loads, weather.com says, hey, Bob here is visiting. I need someone to put an advertisement on this page. I want to make some money. Someone give me an advertisement. So weather.com reaches out to Google's double-click ad exchange. That's what ADX stands for. It's ad exchange. And there are companies other than Google doing this. Um, but what ADX does is it coordinates advertisers with websites that need advertisements. So weather.com reaches out and says, ADX, hey, Bob is visiting a weather website, and I really need an advertisement about that large. So ADX reaches out to companies who are looking to advertise to Bob. This is the first time that companies can really leverage their knowledge about you as individuals. Because ADX can't reach out to every advertiser on the planet every time someone visits a web page. There are too many. So what it does is it reaches out and it says, all right, you, you, and you, you all have Bob in your target audience. So I'm going to ask you, how much are you willing to pay to advertise to Bob? So for companies, it's very important to know individual people so that they can have a list. Now, some, some companies just target demographics. I only want men between 25 and 35. I only want women under 25. You still need to know something about your target audience. You still need some knowledge about the individual visiting the web page. So OK, AdX reaches out, and there are three advertisers in interested in talking with Bob. Let's call the green one State Farm. State Farm happens to know that Bob just bought a convertible. And so State Farm is willing to pay more to advertise to Bob than their competitors. Why? Because they know something about Bob. They know he has a new convertible. He probably needs auto insurance. He's more likely than the average person. So three advertisers are contacted. Which one gets to place the ad? There is a bidding war. There is a bidding war, and all three companies pay a offer to pay a certain amount. How much are they willing to pay to put an advertisement in front of Bob? Let's say State Farm pays a dollar, the second advertiser offers 50 cents, and the third advertiser offers 25 cents. This is a second price auction. So State Farm won by bidding a dollar, but they're going to pay the second price, which is 50 cents. This is the second place that companies get to leverage all their knowledge of you as an individual, because how much they bid determines whether they win the auction, but also whether they bankrupt themselves. If I'm paying more to put an advertisement in front of you than I'm likely to get back, I'm losing money. I'm going out of business. So this is why companies care so much about what you're interested. They care so much about knowing who you are, because they are making and losing money based on how well they know you. So OK, State Farm wins the bid. They cough up 50 cents, and they say, hey, this is the advertisement I want Bob to see. Here you go. Let's put it on weather.com. And this took milliseconds. Bob gets to see what today's weather is, and he gets to see that State Farm is offering him auto insurance. Now, the title of my talk is called How Big Data is Making the Internet Smaller. I want to clarify, the internet is not actually shrinking. However, this is what I mean when I say it is getting smaller. Bob bought a convertible, and now he's seeing auto insurance popping up. Imagine that the internet is like a city. There are an incredible variety of people and an infinite number of stores. But when Bob visits the internet, it's going to feel like a small town, because he's going to see the same familiar faces over and over and he's going to visit the same shops again and again. Companies are heavily interested in giving you the same content over and over, because they know that's what you're interested in. I know that you like cars and auto insurance, so I'm going to make sure that you see that same stuff every time you visit a website. That's how I make money. 
This is what I mean when I say the internet is getting smaller. Now, this kind of can feel like Big Brother's always watching, so I just want to quickly point out some of the good things that come from this kind of scrutiny and individual attention, because make no mistake, you could not use the internet the way you currently do if things were different. So let's talk about cookies. Unfortunately, I don't mean this kind of cookie. I mean a small piece of text. Whenever you visit a website, the website can give a cookie, a small piece of text, to your web browser. This is how weather.com knew that it was Bob visiting. Bob types in weather.com, and his web browser says, hey, I need to know today's weather information. By the way, I have this cookie you gave me before. Now you can remember who I am. Every time you visit a web page and it remembers your username, that's a cookie. Every time you click on a link and it changes color and remembers that you've been there before, that's also a cookie. Every time you're filling out shipping information, you've bought something online, you put in your name, address, credit card information, and then you accidentally close the tab, but when you open it, it's all still there. That's a cookie. In fact, cookies are so ubiquitous that they're even part of our security procedures. How can a website know that it is you, the same person on the same device, logging in to this website? Well, there's a cookie, and that's how it guarantees that the same computer using the same web browser is coming back. So where am I going with this? Is big data good or is it bad? What's, what's the conclusion here? It's neither good nor bad. It's simply big. It's a lot of information. It's a lot of knowledge. And knowledge is power. The reason I want you all to know and to understand what's happening around you is because the legislation is catching up with the technology. This is the way things work right now. But the policies that will govern what is allowed and what is not are still being written you need to be able to answer the question, what is my privacy worth? How do I weigh my privacy versus convenience versus scientific progress? Knowledge is power. And I hope today you've learned something and you feel empowered to answer that question. Thank you.